And then turning on the live caption, give me one moment. Thank you for waiting. Perfect. So before I hand it off to Nick and Kara, I would love to introduce them. So first, let's start with Nick. Nick Larson is an artist living in Santa Fe, New Mexico. He studied at the University of Nevada, Reno and Ohio State University, where he received his MFA in sculpture. Larson has had over a dozen solo and collaborative exhibitions and has been part of a number of notable group exhibitions, including Tilting the Basin, a survey of contemporary art in Nevada. He's also been featured in several editions of New American Paintings. In 2019, he self-published a book of images, drawings, and writings that straddled the line between autobiography and fictionalized archaeological inventory of Queer Mountain, a real though poorly documented wilderness, um, uh, wilderness in Nevada. And then Kara. Kara Goot is a multidisciplinary artist whose primary focus is the image-based digital media. Her work investigates the new shape of human intimacy formed by the internet lifestyle. Constructed detachment from reality and the power dynamics of the virtual. She received an MFA from um, Cranbrook Academy of Art in 2016. Projects include Welcome to My Desert Nexus, a three act play performed within the video game Red Dead Redemption. Part table read, part live gaming event. This project combined the aesthetic language of the theater and the video game. So with that being said, um, thank you, Nick, thank you, Kara, and I'll pass it on. Okay, um, thank you, Berto. Um, yeah, as Alberto mentioned, I am currently in New Mexico, um, which is a pretty recent move. Um, and before that, for about six years, I was in Ohio, which is how Kara and I know each other. And then before that, I lived in Reno. And so, um, and during that time living in Reno, the Holland Project was a super important um, part of my life, you know, a place I saw probably hundreds of bands over the years. And the first place I was able to make, do have kind of solo exhibitions outside of the school environment and place kind of still to this day, my best friends I sort of met in that space. And so um, I was super flattered when um, Alberto extended the invitation for me to um, organize an exhibition in the gallery. And I said yes um, to the opportunity before I really even had an idea of what I might do. Um, and that took me a while to kind of um, think through. And it wasn't until I kind of found this work that I want to share really quickly. that I found these pieces just sort of, you know, scrolling online one day um, that a possible kind of concept for the exhibition came into focus. Um, these pieces are pattern poems by a ninth century uh, Benedictine monk by the name of uh, Ravenous Maris. And, you know, I immediately kind of fell in love with them. They're very beautiful things. Um, I don't know how well the color is coming through on screen, but they have this very kind of lovely, desaturated, aged, um, warm um, color to them. And um, in addition to sort of just being quite lovely things, they also felt really contemporary to me. Um, they felt like they had this relationship to textiles, um, specifically bandanas, which I had been kind of working with and thinking about at that time. And um, what? they also had this uh, sort of interesting um, duality in them, I guess, uh, of being poems and having this kind of text organization, um, but also being quite visual and having this visual composition as well. And it was really that that I keyed into that felt um, like kind of a really contemporary um, layering of, of modes, I guess. And that felt also very resonant with a lot of the artwork that um, an artist that I like today. And so 
kind of from that little seed of almost um, a non idea of thinking about work that that plays with kind of multiple channels or multiple frequencies within the same artwork. And so um, in the show, there's a lot of work that um, has kind of a literary organization and a visual organization. And those two kind of frequencies are working in tandem. And um, I got really excited thinking about the potential of an exhibition that had these pieces that have, you know, layered and multiple things happening within them, also then sitting next to and adjacent to and across from other work with similar things happening. And that the installation then um, becomes almost kind of like a poem as well as you're moving through it. Like that there was a way to kind of enter the space and take in the formal visual qualities of color and material and texture. Um, but then there was another um, kind of experience of the exhibition that may be more about reading and, and, and kind of a closer, slower um, experience of the work as well. And so, um, and so that kind of kernel of an idea really kind of pulled in a lot of different work into its orbit. And I, and I got to think about um, the way that those things would sit together um, in a lot of different ways, particularly because the Holland Project is split into two galleries. And so there, there's almost like two, um, two movements of, of, a, of a composition um, that plays itself out in the space. And um, yeah, and so I'm actually gonna let Kara kind of talk more specifically about her work in the show, um, but uh, I thought it might be nice to kind of ground the exhibition in the place that it was granted for, for me, which is um, these works here that kind of became the inspiration for the whole thing. Yeah, sure. Let me share my screen now. Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, Alberto, thank you for having me. And Nick, I'm so happy that we're able to be in conversation and that I was involved in this show. I feel so like, I feel so lucky. It's like a group of really great artists and I think the show turned out really well. Here we are. I'm just gonna, I'm kind of keeping things a little more casual. I'm gonna just be going through my website. Um, so this is my Tumblr website. <laughs> so here is um, RPG Gothic. This is a um, artist book that I published through um, a new startup publisher called New Archive. They formed a few years ago, I think around 2018. Um, they are friends of mine from Cranbrook and you should definitely check them out there a great little company publisher that are interested in making kind of like one-off runs of artist books that are a little bit outside of the realm of the traditional artist book. Um, they were really interested in working with me to create kind of a, a project that could kind of see itself within my body of work, but not necessarily um, sort of like a retrospective of what I've made before. They wanted to make something new with me and I wanted to make a uh, font book. So these are, it's a font book of um, fantasy inspired fonts that are found on the internet and um, they are all free for download. So anyone can download them wherever, whenever for now. Um, and I just wanted to make this collection of fonts that um, kind of encapsulated the internet at this point in time because the internet changes and things come and go. And I thought that the ability to have these for free at this point in time was kind of special. And just to have them like available in physical space as well for people to view in a traditional way in the way that font books um, used to be viewed and or used to be distributed went before fonts were available online. Um, and so we really had a lot of fun with it. And um, I included a lot of 
these faux pangrams. So like the, I think it's like the quick fox jumps over the lazy dog is an example of like a pangram because it um, has every uh, like letter in the alphabet within the sentence. And so I kind of took that idea and um, sourced these little clips of sort of found poetry that I would find in like comment sections or like on tutorials of like how to how to's and like YouTube videos and kind of anywhere where I thought I could find some like little fantasy um, sort of found poetry. Let me scroll back up to this one. Um, and really just treating them as pangrams within the um, within the overall font book. And so it's a pretty thick book. It's about 240 pages, I believe. And I split it up into sections that are sort of arbitrary, but based on like kind of a theme of like, um, like some are battlements because they feel like they have some like relationship to castle architecture and others are engravings because they feel like they would be etched in stone, you know, in whatever fantasy world that you're creating within your digital space. Um, so that is my, uh, that was my piece in the show. Um, I mean, Kara, it was interesting <laughs> when I, when we were installing the exhibition and I was sort of trying to give all of that <laughs> information that you just gave in like a condensed version. And I, I found myself kind of starting that conversation by saying like, this is actually quite different than what Kara typically does, quote unquote. And, and as I thought about it more and more, I actually realized like that that's not really accurate, that, um, that it kind of is in line with your practice of kind of mining or um, sourcing content from the internet that then kind of comes out into the real world in some way and then maybe moves back into it and this kind of like input output and and kind of constant um I don't know weaving between those two those two worlds mm -hmm. yeah definitely and it's actually a practice like of like this found poetry it's actually something that I was doing already like in my own like kind of like research slash like collage because I have this like way of working where I'm constantly just grabbing screenshots of things and usually there's screenshots of small little bits of text. And so it kind of was like this weird, perfect fit where I had all of these kind of already as this little archive of like these goofy little poems that could easily be turned into these like, yeah, these pangrams. And so, and also I found out later that there is this like, um, it's called web weaving on Tumblr. I guess is this like kind of like community of people that uh, do like these screenshots of text and create these um, these like woven blog posts mm -hmm. of um, like related texts, which I found really interesting. But I didn't know that until later because that's kind of how the internet works. Yeah. Um, but, <laughs> but yeah, it's sort of like this weird thing that just came out of like my like way of. I guess I call it research, but it's kind of like the way I work, like kind of like the computer is my studio in a way. Like I'm just kind of like grabbing things and sorting them and moving them around. Um, and yeah, so it, it kind of like fit pretty seamlessly into this idea. And also, yeah, the idea of things like being input into digital space, getting like jumbled around and then coming out the other side as these artifacts really like ties into the rest of my practice and kind of like more specifically um, my sculptural work. So this kind of feels like half artist book, half like piece of like, like object in a way. So mm -hmm. yeah, just interesting how that kind of transformed. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I think it's interesting um, thinking about it in relationship to the sculptural work, which um, again, kind of has this like origin in like the, the digital or the virtual or the kind of video or the online or the gaming realm that then 
sort of pulls itself out into the real world, but then also kind of situates itself in a way that to be folded back into kind of an imaging, an image or an image space or like an environmental, an online environment or, um, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Sorry, that's a lot to throw, but no, uh, it's, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm like so also interested. I'm interested in that aspect of, yeah, like this um, like Ouroboros of like physical, digital, physical, digital, because it's happening constantly, like this recycling of content. Um, and yeah, maybe I should show some of my, what I'm talking about. <laughs> I'll take a second to load here. So, um, this is kind of more what I'm talking about in terms of like the sculptural, the, the prop work that I have started making over the last few years. Um, and there's this relationship to like flatness and the collaged image and it being this like prop that kind of exists as this three-dimensional object, but is very much supposed to be seen from like certain angles and to be perceived as like a prop. Yeah. Um, and also has this like, yeah, like this relationship to like digital space where it's has been output um, or has or has the ability to then like be input back by being imaged again. Um, yeah, this was a fun show. <laughs> Yeah, looking at these images, I mean, I think the idea of calling them, like maybe it's not a, a that interesting of a distinction, but even just the language of a sculpture or a prop mm -hmm. and thinking about like these objects feel very much like almost of a theater realm. And like you said, that there's a clear way that you're looking at them, that there, that there is a clear front, you know? Mm -hmm. um, as distinct, like, which is a distinction from maybe typical, typically thinking about sculpture. Um, yeah, definitely. I like kind of, I call these like three dimensional images, mm -hmm. which like, because they also have this like idea that there is like, that they rep, they don't, they're necessarily existing to be like perceived as like a real thing, but rather something that is supposed to be a stand in for the real thing or supposed to like, can note to the viewer like you are supposed to be suspending your disbelief right now and this is supposed to be like existing in some like play space or illusion illusion space where there's this agreement between like the like the viewer and the artist that this is like a, a moment of the suspension of disbelief and so I feel like that is like that I feel like digital space has such like a I don't know, there's like such a, uh, oops, my internet connection went away. Hopefully that doesn't, okay, we're still here. Um, I feel like digital space has such a relationship to like theater space in yeah. that way. And like performance is kind of wrapped up in that. And this like performance of flatness. Let me go to this other project also. Um, I also create these sculptures that are um, these pseudo green screens. I call them like my chroma key paintings. And they're supposed to basically exist as these um, like proto green screen walls that um, maybe at one time could have been chroma keyed out or are about to be chroma keyed or have they have like information on them, but they also have this like ability to become invisible and this ability to like seamlessly go back into or be like placed back into digital space. And so that's another part of like the image flatness kind of conversation um, that is like always like floating through my work um, and especially in the sculpture. Yeah, I, I mean, I, we talked about this a little bit before, um, or I have talked about this in, in the past, but like this idea of, yeah, things made um, kind of with the lens in mind or with the idea of being re-photographed in mind. And I think it's interesting, like looking at these chroma key paintings um, I, that 
like you originally started out as a photographer and that maybe that kind of grounds and foregrounds like all of everything that came afterwards whether it's you know paintings quote unquote or um video work or um kind of performance within an online or gaming environment yeah absolutely for sure i feel like i'm yeah as a photographer brain i just approach everything as like an image or having been through some sort of imaging process um and that is definitely like first and foremost how i like relate to basically the world um and definitely there's like the aspect of everything being an image and also the aspect of performing for the lens and performing for the screen that is definitely like that's kind of like the school um, that I came out of um, I studied under Liz Cohen who is a performance slash photographer a performance artist slash photographer and definitely like the the um, image being the the performance being made for the image was like a very um something very influential that comes up again and again mm -hmm. um, let me see if i should i think there's one more that i want to show here's one more a blue chroma key painting um and maybe this ties back into um the next, uh, the, the current show that I have up right now yeah. uh, at Spaces Cleveland called Hydra. I can show some of that. Let me flip over to there. So this is the show that is up currently right now at Spaces Cleveland. It opened last week um, and it is an extension of this like chroma key, like working with um, chroma key fabric and green screen and the um, the tr kind of dealing with like the trappings of or like the materials used for interacting with digital space whether it's like server rooms or like chroma key or you know anything that has even like I'm doing like research right now into like mining farms like anything that has like this physical footprint that is made for something that is allegedly like non-physical or is has no real footprint I'm like really interested in like the vestiges of that and how those then like become these like artifacts from that space or in like reference to that space and so I think there's another photo here yeah i mean while you're looking Kara, i'm just gonna comment like that seems like and and maybe even i saw a comment come up in the chat suggesting this as well but that these things are both kind of like obviously playing with absence and presence and like being very um being an object or being a form that can also disappear being kind of a figure that can become a ground and like how you're sort of pushing and pulling on um, what's visible, what's legible, what's present, what's tangible, what's material, what's immaterial. Um, and kind of, again, yeah, that, that like um, smudging of those boundaries between things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I feel like it has such a relationship to the way that we like exist in both spaces i always say like we're like hybrid beings mm -hmm. like we're existing in both spaces and our material is coming out in both ways like what what whatever content we're creating whatever like messes we're making <laughs> it's all kind of like happening like on both sides and like in service of each other and i just feel like there's this constant like recycling of image of performance like going on um whether intentional or unintentional mm -hmm. <laughs> um and so maybe i should i can talk a little bit about this this is kind of like extending that prop metaphor to like the idea that these are i don't these, think we're seeing what you're what you're oh sorry 
Oh, I'm just talking more about Hydra. <laughs> oh, sorry. I thought you were picking yeah, yeah, yeah. Some... No, sorry. I had to switch sorry. back to my notes. Okay. I have my little notes over here. Um, and I opened the chat. I'm going to put that over there. Um, yeah, so these kind of have that same relationship to like the prop and like what is made for um, the screen and, how, and these are like in service of the screen. But in this case, they are um, supposed to be the limbs of like this Hydra, this mythical Hydra being um, and like thinking about like modularity and how like in like the language of new media by Lev Manovich, he has these like five like principles that um, like a new media object must contain. And one of those is modularity. And I kept thinking about like, what is the like ideal, like if, te if technology wanted um, to create its own like ideal being to like inhabit it, what would that be? And like this idea that it has like multiple like limbs that could regenerate if like one is cut off to grow in its place like this ever um, evolving like multi-limbed being that could like produce content like simultaneously like in all of these different streams and what what would that look like yeah. and like imagining like the yeah like not the ideal but like the most like to its furthest means taking like digital space and taking like technology to the furthest means, what would that being look like? And so that's kind of um, the idea within this show. I mean, it's interesting too, to like reference mythology in this case and the you know, RPG Gothic references, these kind of fantasy fonts. And um, there is this, kind of um, fantasy aesthetic that permeates the work that feels analogous to, and maybe this is like forcing a relationship in some way, but kind of feels analogous to this like online fantasy, um, yeah, online fantasy kind of realm or space. Does that make sense? Yeah, definitely. I feel like there's just like, definitely a relationship between like I mean every basically technology slash like digital space slash you know like how we're existing um currently is like kind of this we're in this space of like having these great technologies but not necessarily knowing everything about them and not knowing exactly how they work and there's sort of like this still this like mystical magical quality about them and in that way I feel like that like then the metaphor of like fantasy kind of just gets really like easily applied yeah it just like gets it, it fits right in and also like that there's like just like I'm also like in interested in a lot of like fandoms that and then just like currently have a lot to do with like fantasy space and cosplaying and like fiction and performance I feel like it's all kind of like wrapped like together into this like ball yeah. of meanings um and so yeah I feel like the fantasy metaphor is just very like apt for how we feel about things that we don't understand yeah like in the way that like myths evolve out of the unknown and so yeah I'm just playing a little bit of this video yeah. is can everybody see that am I on the right page I'm just making sure yeah okay yeah. it's it's gone um, and so this is the, this is a performance called Self-Portrait as the Final Boss, and it's an extension of the, um, of the physical work, and is also a performance that I, I did in Second Life, where I was moving the, I attached a bunch of squid arms to my avatar, and I was moving my avatar in space, just slightly like creating this like undulating form and kind of imagining this like multi-limbed being that would be this like, you know, the dream of like technology hive mind. <laughs> mm -hmm. So should I talk about some videos? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I was gonna say one thing you mentioned in that 
um, before we were showing that was this idea of fandom. And mm -hmm. I remember, I don't know if you told me this or if I read it in something that you had sent me, but this mm -hmm. idea that like making a thing in real life that comes out of gaming or kind of a digital space and being a fan of something is like this ultimate kind of longing or um, yeah, just sort of earnest gesture towards like this idea, this fantasy realm um, mm -hmm. and trying to have even just a little piece of it kind of um, in, in the real world and, you know, in the physical world. Yeah, definitely. Like reaching for something that never actually existed. Um, I can actually show a video that was like kind of like a good segue from talking about this like physical slash um, digital work. Um, let me just go to my videos. So one of the first videos I made after I graduated from grad school and was kind of like thinking a lot about all these um, issues of like, like things that are like input into digital space and then output again in the same realm as the sculptures that I've been showing um, was this video called He Wishes for the Cloths of Heaven. And it's this appropriated footage montage of people crafting um, the, these weapons that have only ever existed um, in video games. So they're not like based on historical weapons. They're just these like purely digital items. And then this crafting of them kind of makes them real and sudden and like the 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 like loss in translation between digital and physical is apparent because they're like making them out of like whatever they have. I think this guy's using like some kind of like chipboard and and there's like mold making involved, but essentially it's still not exactly the same as like what it could have been. And so um, there's like this like longing for to be close to the thing that I feel is like very apparent in fandom and very apparent like that's kind of like where I come from in terms of like how I'm framing all of this because I like grew up in like growing up with the internet and like growing up within a realm of fandom like thinking about longing in this way where you're trying to be like you're trying to embody something or trying to be close to the thing and the way you do that is to like construct or to make content and so this was like a, an ode to um, the way that we create like this abstracted intimacy um, through objects and um, how we can feel intimacy through like longing for something um, that never really existed if that makes sense. Should I play a little bit of this? Yeah, go for it. See if I can just... Listen to this voice. It's reasonable. You can hear me. You can understand me. I don't know you, but my voice lets you know that I love you. Let's begin. Okay, I 
just wanted to play a little bit of that just to give an idea. Yeah. Um, the poem in the background is um, obviously he wishes for the gloss of heaven. Um, and I feel like it's an apt like metaphor mm -hmm. <laughs> for the subject matter. Um, yeah, and so that's an earlier video. Um, I think that was from 2017. Um, and then from there, I kind of just kept like using like this appropriated slash like right like sort of video essay style, um, just kind of using that style as a way to like talk about um, intimacy and fandom and the digital space and how we kind of exist within it. And maybe I can talk a little bit about also intimacy mod. Yeah, so, that was going to be, that was. Yeah, <laughs> kind of makes sense. Yeah, yeah it kind of makes sense to go right into that. Um, so this um, is a, a series that I've been working on for a while that kind of just keeps going on and on. Um, it's, a, it's sort of a performance slash video, um, and it has to do with the concept of modding. So modding um, stands for modification, and it's uh, basically a way that you can augment your video game. Um, and it's usually free, but you can also pay for mods to be installed onto your game. And in this case, I started modding Skyrim. And Skyrim is basically like an RPG, like a fantasy adventure game from 2012 or 2011. And um, a lot of people played it at the time and I, and it had a huge modding community surrounding it. And so people were making mods for like for free, just for fun. Um, and there was just this huge like community surrounding it. And I um, found this, there was this mod called Immersive Lovers Comfort that is, it fuses the models at the mouth and you, um, just ragged all to the floor because in the base game you can't actually kiss you can't I believe you can hug and that's as much as you can do um, and so this was a way to be intimate with your spouse and so I um, installed the mod and started doing these performances where I would just see how um, distorted the mod could get so the more um, mods you install on top of that mod it gets like kind of glitchy and so I just kept installing more mods and more mods and then I would also send the characters off of like a cliff I would put them somewhere really precarious and basically create these like random these performances that were different every time um, depending on where they were in the world what they were doing what they were holding on to and how far they were apart from each other and so it just became this like ongoing series. I'm gonna play a little bit of it actually. Back for more. Since we had so much fun the last time, I'll join you free of charge. Hmm. Divine smile on you, friend. Farewell then. If you need my services again, just come and look for me in the usual place. An adventure like you.
Okay. That's a little bit of intimacy mod. Yeah. And intimacy mod, that project, so you sort of talked about it as these performances in the in the kind of game space, but it also became like a thing that you performed in kind of real time in the live environment too as well, right? Yeah, and so <clears throat> totally. I was always thinking of these as like a performance for like the screen and like having like the end uh, result being this video or like these one minute performances, like each kiss would be one. Um, but then there was this opportunity to do it live. There was this um, performance series in Detroit called Performance Proxy, where the artist is supposed to perform something but can't be present. And so the artwork is a stand-in for their body. And so I was, I thought like this would be perfect. So I proposed this as like a live thing that I would do. And I had a um, laptop set up and it was streamed on Twitch. And basically they would just write in, I had like all of the character codes listed on like a piece of paper and people would come up to the laptop and just write in the character code uh, depending on who they wanted to kiss who and like what they wanted the people to wear and where they wanted to go to kit do the kiss and so it became this like relationship with the viewer where we were like like working together to create this performance um and it was really it created some like pretty funny and exciting results yeah. like things that i would have never tried and so it was this nice like reaching across space <laughs> in this intimate way and like kind of revealing what you wanted, you know, like the viewer wanted and kind of this compromise depending, <laughs> depending on if it was achievable or not. And I, yeah, I thought it was like just this interesting like outgrowth from that piece and kind of unexpected. And so I've performed it two different times um, and usually it's about an hour of people sending suggestions and then like also like giving their comments in the, in the Twitch chat. And yeah, it just becomes this like exchange. Yeah. And kind of like, yeah, like kind of like weirdly intimate and also very like public. <laughs> yeah, which is the internet in a way, yes. you know, like um, it, I mean, what strikes me about this, um, and also welcome to my Desert Nexus, which I want to make sure we have time to talk about, um, okay. is, I mean, I think collaboration is a big part of, or a, a kind of a through line in your work in a lot of different ways. It's like some in the kind of traditional way we think about an artist working with another artist, and then ways like this, where you're sort of inviting, um, people to participate in a way and kind of allowing that to play itself out in whatever way it's going to and in the ways like things do on the internet when you're anonymous or they don't you know necessarily know how to be behaving and what's possible you know testing boundaries of what's possible or how far can this go or mm -hmm. um like there seems to be this real interest in you can correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems to be this interest in what um, some of these things about like not tempting chaos, but opening it up to maybe um, even if things start from a script or start from a very kind of specific um, kind of structure um, that there is inviting the possibility that things could go off the rails or go in a different direction than maybe you initially anticipated. Yeah, I feel like I, th I thrive off of that potential of chaos, but surprisingly, it doesn't happen all that much. Yeah. <laughs> but I like, I love like the idea that someone would find like this, you know, in the wild and then have like a reaction to it and then let me know. You know, I love like the idea of reaching out into the void and then like someone reaching back out, you know, and like connecting, um, like just by like like yelling out like is there anyone there and then like someone yelling back yeah of. yeah um and yeah there is chaos with i guess inherent in that but also 
the internet is also a kind of a lonely place. Like I feel like it forces, like I, I, I don't, it's in my bio, I guess, but like it forces this detachment from reality and like this isolation, but it also is like this potential to be like, you're in a crowd, you, you have the potential to make connections, but sometimes it doesn't feel that way. So like highlighting ways that you can make connection feels important to me. Yeah in like surprising ways and not just like arguing on Twitter. <laughs> so yeah, um, I'm going to talk about, yeah, before we run out of time. Yeah, I don't want to run out of time. About this. Um, so this is Welcome to My Desert Nexus, which was um, like probably the largest project I've ever done. Um, this was part of my residency at Pioneer Works last year. Uh, it, it ended basically in a presentation of this three-act play that I had been working on within a video game and so essentially there it's a three-act play it's about an hour and I had three actors who were controlling avatars within Red Dead Redemption 2 and um, also were performing live on stage and so it's this weird hybrid happening where people were observing um, people just playing games kind of like at a live gaming event mm -hmm. and also observing like this cinematic play that was happening within digital space and it was also like live streamed so there were people that weren't you didn't know that this was happening live on stage at all necessarily which I kind of love and then there's people that were within our game because it was a live or it was um it was online. So there were people that walked th through the play who had no idea what was going on, kind of like as you would if someone was like having a play on like a, a street corner, <laughs> essentially. Yeah. And so that also like invited chaos, but luckily like nothing really happened. No one was, no one was taken out of the performance, but um, I love the potential for that to have happened or like, I mean, it happened a lot during our practice runs, um, but the idea that someone would like just kind of happen upon this in the game is kind of thrilling to me. And I just like would love to know somebody's reaction to this when they saw us practicing and when like just by like going through on their horse. Um, I can play a little bit of, I can play like a, a snippet of act two. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. okay, cool. Let me see if I have it up. Let me go through all my, there we go, okay. Oh, perhaps if you knew something of my past, something of my present, you would see the humanity in letting me go. I will recount it to you and let you be the judge. Alas, it will not sway me. Once my plans are laid, they do not change. Something you must know about me if we are to be partners. It was something Francis despised. But friend, we are starting anew. No before, no Francis, only us two and our secrets. Could that alone be enough to untie me? I, I was a lawman myself. In fact, they are coming for you now. If you untie me, you will be spared. I've heard enough. Why did I think for a second you could be trusted? Where are you taking me? The law is coming for us now. I hear their whistles. I hear their horses. About 30 lawmen, I swear. I hear nothing but the wind, you fool. Wait, I, I didn't mean it. I was no lawman. Please, I take it back. Ha, huh. perhaps you have no use to me after all. How am I ever to believe you, to ever trust you, or any living soul for that matter? You have what's left of my honor, what's left of my word. But what good is my word? I beg of you, take me back to the horse and I will lie no longer. I will complain no longer. This is your final chance to prove yourself worthy of my company. Tell me what has truly happened to Francis. Francis, he didn't abandon me. That was a lie. My final lie, please hold your fire. Give me a reason. It was my intention that you would lose all hope in Francis to trust me instead. 
What have you done with Francis? Nothing at all. We were accosted in the roadway. A group took Francis and threw me to the ground. I should leave you here to die. You say for certain that they took him. Yes, and I can show you the direction. If only you untie me first. Ugh. You snake. How can I discern if any of this is true? I suppose you cannot. But as we both agreed, this place is not meant for trusting. Now, you will use me to get your darling Francis, and I will use you for my freedom. Ugh. You will not regret this decision, friend. Silence. So that was just a little snippet from act two. And I forgot to add that um, while that was happening live, I was sitting, I was the narrator and I was switching between viewpoints live. So I was actually cutting the, the play in real time, which was really scary, <laughs> mm -hmm. but it, it worked out okay. So the folks on stage care, they're, they are obviously the voices reading the script that you wrote. Are they also controlling like the character? Yeah, so they're gaming. You can't really tell maybe from this photo, but the two in front have like controllers in their laps and then um, Noah was playing like old school <laughs> on the keyboard. Mm -hmm. And so, and I was also playing, I also had a controller and a character. So my character was the narrator and luckily he just kind of sat there and talked every once in a while. But um, yeah, the cutting between people, I had like a special like video switcher that I was able to do that with, but it was like live TV. I mean, it was, it was an event for sure. It was yeah. um, challenging. But, in, um, sorry, I keep interrupting. Um, in that, in the script that you wrote, did it have kind of the stage direction or kind of the action mapped out too, or was it um, like how did the the like what the characters were going to do? Was that part of the rehearsal process or sort of the vision from from this stage when you were writing it? Yeah, so I kind of did a little bit of both. I definitely had here's this. The, um, a little chat book that we made of the script. Um, I did write a lot of the direction, but also I kind of wrote it not quite knowing if it was totally possible. And then I actually had like, we had a lot of like blocking practice where we had to memorize exactly like, this is the marker we're going to hit. This is the train section, you know, the train tracks that we're going to go to. And actually during that clip that I just showed, you can like, uh, the one actor is like looking down the way to see if there's actually a train coming because we weren't sure if he was going to get run over or not. Mm -hmm. So that could have ended the play. Um, but luckily there was no train. Yeah. But yeah. It, it took a lot of like memorizing and kind of figuring out what's actually possible. Like there's a shootout at one point and like blocking that whole thing in digital space was really interesting <laughs> and, and challenging um, but yeah it was a lot of fun also so just a fun experiment <laughs> yeah yeah I've, I mean I've definitely we've obviously talked about this before but I've never kind of got into the nuts and bolts of like how much of it was sort of set or or kind of baked into what you were doing and how much of it was open to Mm -hmm. if any if any of it was open to yeah. kind of improvisation or happenstance or you know that sort of chaotic element yeah definitely there I was I encouraged the actors also to like kind of break out of things and like do their own thing if they felt it in the moment and actually yeah. <clears throat> at the end of the play there's this moment where like Francis is about to shoot Charlie like the you know the main characters are having this moment where one is supposed to like maybe shoot the other and then he actually does and misses so like is very close to hitting the other actor and mm -hmm. if that would have happened then he would have died because they're you, I don't know if you could like tell but they were all in like absolutely low health because mm -hmm. part of Red Dead Redemption is you have to keep eating and taking care of yourself and feeding your horse and like that's part of the game and we were busy <laughs> we were busy um like doing the play yeah. and so it's interesting how I'm also like running up against these 
like blockades put in place by like playing the game wrong and I love the idea that there's like an element of like refusal involved in making things in video games because you're actively like going against you're like transgressing the rules of the game and using the game as a raw material for something completely different that it wasn't anticipated for and so I find that like really interesting to to mess with those boundaries yeah yeah so yeah. I'm glad we got to show a little bit of that I know but <laughs> as you said it's always the most recent thing and you never get to it so mm -hmm. I think that's a good place Berto I don't know if you want to jump back in and if there's any questions in the chat or anybody wants to ask anything but I think that's probably a good place for us to stop showing work anyway yeah I'd love to open it up to Q&A um there is a little hand raising function in the toolbar if anyone would like to unmute and state their question or the chat function can also be utilized for that as well. I might start out with a question if that's okay. Yeah. Uh, I know you talk about fandom. Does fandom come into play to why you use um, Tumblr as a website source? <laughs> Yeah, so um, I've been using Tumblr since 2009, which is kind of embarrassing, maybe, I guess. I, I'm not embarrassed, but <laughs> I think other people are. Um, and I actually, yeah, I use my, my website is based on Tumblr. And it's actually, I have like another, I have a few other blogs and one that I maintain that's just for like generating research and kind of like sketches. And I like, I, I use it constantly. And I've used it constantly since 2009. And I feel like that like has yeah. kept me like just I, like I learned about modding um, from Tumblr. So it's just been like kind of this generative place for me. I never really was a Reddit person, weirdly. So Tumblr has been kind of like my home for the past like 10, 12 years. <laughs> so yeah, it's I feel like, yeah, it's my home a little bit. We do have a question from Jenny. Jenny, if you want to unmute. Hey, um, thank you so much for sharing. I'm just enjoying this so much. I had a question about Hydra. Um, and I was just wondering, I loved like how the video of the Hydra was with the actual sculptural pieces. And I was wondering if you ever further explore that hy hybrid space by using the chroma, what is it, chroma cone, chroma? Chroma key, yeah. Yeah, chroma key, um, like bringing that, like the sculptural sp space back into the digital space and like, do you, do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, totally, <laughs> totally. I've like experimented with that a lot and for some reason it hasn't, I don't, I'm trying to think of if I've actually turned that into a piece yet. And I don't think I have, which is kind of crazy. Um, but I've definitely like had a lot of like, you know, the definitely the back and forth. Like I've I've made a lot of these chroma key things and then have then like done experiments where I turn them back into um, digital objects, but I don't think I have any like actually like presented pieces other than I do have a collaboration with um, my friend. Claire Gatto and we are working on we're currently working on a video game that actually does that which is kind of funny um it's so actually maybe I can show some of that okay so so we um have been working on these basically these um these rooms that act as levels and so basically um, Claire's work has a lot to do with photogrammetry and scanning and like, uh, like 3D modeling. And so basically this is kind of like at like the nexus of our work, which is essentially um, we create a space and then we scan the entire room and then are turning that into the, like each level of the game. So in that way, I mean, it doesn't have anything to do with the chroma key elements yet, like potentially it will, but um, it is like a, like a back into virtual space action, I guess you could say. 
And so we make all of these different um, kind of like interjections into the space. So these like three dimensionally, um, these are like uh, three dimensional prints or three dimensional objects printed onto chiffon that are then rescanned and they become three dimensional when you scan them again, <laughs> because the camera doesn't understand what it's looking at. And so those like the back and forth of that action is kind of what the video game will be about. So it's interesting that you brought that up. I totally <laughs> forgot about that. But um, yeah, thank you for the question. Oh yeah, thanks for sharing. I love that, that tension. Yeah. Ashley, do you want to go ahead and um, unmute? Yes, thank you. Um, thank you for sharing. This has been wonderful. Uh, I was hoping you could speak to your decision to use Red Dead Redemption 2 specifically. It was the play built around the game or was the game selected based on the content of the play? Yeah, so the game, the play was selected based on the game because I had been kind of researching Red Dead for a while before this and was like really fascinated with like the weird fictional depiction of this like fantasy style West, like the, the American West and how that like is kind of like this little strange bubble that they've created in this game that like has all of the different climates of like, the Western regions of the United States and is supposed to be this like pseudo historically accurate, like it takes place during an actual time period. It has like potentially like people that are like historical figures within the game. And I thought that it was like such a fascinating like microcosm for like thinking about like digital space and it being like this frontier and like the language of the frontier and how like it's this idealized landscape and how that is almost never like the case. <laughs> and so like playing with that like metaphor felt really kind of rich to me. So I started writing the play like with that in mind. So that was definitely, definitely part of the process. It's a beautiful game though too. It's yeah. like a, it's like a fantastic like beautiful I mean I think it came out in 2018 but it's still like very very like it holds up still um, but yeah thank you for your question thank you it's, I was going to say too it's very like like the way like the how the characters are in the frame too it's like a very cinematic in the way that it's all you know like, like it's not, we're not seeing it necessarily from anyone's like their point of view. It's like, it, the, and I know that that's partly because of how you are editing it and, uh, and, and controlling it in real time. But um, yeah, it feels like a movie. It's that lush and that kind of, um, yeah, beautiful. Yeah, it is. It's like one of the games that really caught like my attention when, yeah, it, it just it, it caught my eye as like a beautiful cinematic landscape for sure. Mm -hmm. That like when you're looking for things to make machinima out of, which is like just video, um, like basically movies made from video games. It's like this is kind of like super idyllic and beautiful. Like no matter what vantage point you're working with. Yeah. Looks like Garrett raised his hand. Garrett, if you want to unmute. Hi. Uh, wanted to just say, first off, thank you so much. Uh, oh, can you hear me okay? I can't tell. Yeah, you're good. Okay. Awesome, cool. Um, thank you so much for the talk. I joined a little bit late, so I'm not sure if you already addressed this, and you just mentioned it, but this just reminded me of being young on the internet and YouTube like 10 years ago, um, and Machinima being a whole thing like I remember like when red versus blue was a thing a bunch of videos being made in Halo and Call of Duty and fear and stuff like that being like a whole world of creators that kind of blew up on YouTube around that time um that I totally forgotten about and this reminded me and I was wondering if that world influenced you and that sort of medium how it became a whole thing like there's the machinima company that supported creators and stuff and that um and it just reminded me of that and I was wondering if 
you could talk to that if it influenced you at all and um, what your perspective on that was. Yeah, so when I first started making um, like work within video games, I didn't know that that was already, I, I'd heard of Red versus Blue, but I didn't realize it was a huge like, community of makers. I didn't know how big it had been. Um, but then I like soon found, I quickly found out through like just making things and like like researching other um, artists working in video games. And like, I so I kind of got in kind of like at a, like from the side, I guess, um, and like really started like making purely because I was interested in performance. And so this was just like kind of a fascinating world to like just kind of get dumped into. And yeah, like now I've, I recently taught a, um, a class at Pioneer Works about machinima and like just like finding out about all of the different um, ways in which uh, video games have been used for entertainment, for art, like for performance, it's just really wild. And especially like during, um, during quarantine with people performing, like I think within The Sims 2 or within, yeah, The Sims 2 and like a couple different like Fallout. I think that people were like forming theater troops within Fallout 76. It's just so interesting how like that kind of happened, like as a reaction to, you know, out of necessity for COVID, but also was like a hearkening back to like the early 2000s and that explosion of, um, of like, like proto, like animation in some way and so it's just interesting to like revisit all that and see that there was this whole like legacy before us was just really interesting so yeah thanks for your question <laughs> thank you there is a question in the chat but i think it's a good like conclusion question to end it all so i will open it up for anyone else if they had any other questions you can Again, raise your hand and use the like raising hand um, function in the toolbar or state your um, question in the chat. Okay, so the last question is by Paige and they ask, do you have any more of these interactive events planned out at the moment slash um, how can we keep an eye out? Well, <laughs> um, I don't have anything like for sure planned yet, but I do, I post things to my Instagram a lot. Um, and I am really interested in doing more um, of, of the intimacy mod performances. Um, I might do one later this year in New York if I have the opportunity. Um, and yeah, so I, I definitely, I'm also working on, in the background, I'm working on a second play, but it's been really slow. Um, it's about speed running, which is like completing the game as fast as you can the, <laughs> with, for whatever, like with whatever means necessary sometimes. Um, and so I'm like working on that in the background, but that probably won't be done for a little while because I plan to like also um, work on speed running Dark Souls 3. Um, and, but yeah, so for now, I'm just looking to, um, do more intimacy mod live performances and I'll update things on my Instagram as they happen. So. Okay. If that was, um, the last question, I think it's a good place to conclude today's chat. Um, I want to thank Nick and I want to thank Kara again for their time and for, every, for all of you who showed up. I know a lot of you are showing up from different time zones, so I really appreciate everyone spending their Tuesday evening with us. Um, and Holding Pattern, curated by Nick Larson, is on view until Friday, and there will be special hours from 12 to 8. So if you're located in Reno, please check it out before it's gone. Um, you get to see all the amazing work that Nick kind of mentioned that first, um, the first round of his little presentation, and we get to see Kara's um, amazing um, book of fonts that we that they got to talk about so again thank you everyone um have a safe and beautiful night thanks Bruno. thank you bye everybody